As it is 10 o'clock, we'd like to begin the um, hearing if we could. So good morning and welcome to the Subcommittee on Elections and this hearing on Election Day Registration and Provisional Voting. Section 302 of the Help America Vote Act, known as HAVA, outlined the provisional balloting process but left room for states to determine, uh, determine the procedure. This includes who qualifies as a registered voter eligible to cast a provisional ballot that will be counted and in what jurisdiction a ballot must be cast in order to be counted. Generally, if a registered voter appears at a polling place to vote in an election for federal office, but either the voter's name does not appear on the official list of eligible voters or an election official asserts that the individual is not eligible to vote, that voter must be permitted to cast a provisional ballot. After the 2004 election, there were several lawsuits on whether a vote cast in the wrong precinct but the correct county should be counted. The Sixth Circuit in Sandusky County Democratic Party versus Blackwell held that ballots cast in a precinct where the voter does not reside and which would be un invalid under state law are not required by HAVA to be considered legal votes. Based on the court's interpretation of HAVA, states have the discretion to determine how they define jurisdiction for the purpose of counting provisional ballots. However, the litigation clarified the right of the voter to be directed to the correct precinct to vote and have their vote counted as well as the right to a provisional ballot. While states are primarily responsible for uh, regulation, federal, uh, federal, state, and local elections, HAVA was an attempt to allow more voters to have their ballots uh, uh, cast. However, however, with varying state procedures on provisional ballot, in some votes in elec federal elections are being counted and others are not. And according to the EAC report on provisional voting in the 2004 election, nationwide with about 1.9 million votes, or 1.6% of the turnout uh, were cast as provisional ballots. Of that number, more than 1.2 million, or just over 63%, were counted. Directly related to provisional voting is election day registration, also called same day registration. It allows eligible voters to register and cast a ballot on election day. EDR significantly increases the opportunity for all citizens to cast a vote. According to Demos, the 2004 presidential election, uh, the seven EDR states had an average turnout 12% higher than that of non-EDR states. EDR is shown to have many benefits for voters. Earlier this fall, the subcommittee uh, held a hearing on committee list maintenance, and we discussed the eligible voters who may have been mistakenly purged from the voting rolls. ED EDR provides those eligible voters an opportunity to vote and have their vote counted instead of taking the chance with a provisional ballot, which may not be counted. Uh, EDR also provides another opportunity for people who have not had time or have just become eligible uh, and who've missed the, a, a longer deadline or maybe just forgot to register to vote. And beyond this, EDR leads to the enfranchisement of voters who have recently moved and lower income voters. In states where EDR is in place, it has resulted in lower costs for election administrators because it eliminates the need for provisional balloting. Election day registration, however, is not without criticism particularly over whether allowing voters to cast ballots on the same day they register fails to provide sec uh, adequate security and whether this uh, allows for um, voter fraud. So I look forward to the testimony from Demos and from the other witnesses as they uh, Demos has done a study of the nearly 4,000 news reports for the six EDR states over three federal election cycles and found only 10 discrete instances of potential fraud. Of course, uh, there was only one case of voter impersonation at the polls. Our witnesses today will discuss the pros and cons of election day registration and provisional voting. The panels provide a state and local view of how these affect voter participation and administration, as well as uh, academic and advocacy insights into these two issues. Uh, I would now uh, like to recognize our ranking member, uh, Mr. McCarthy, for any opening statement he may make. Well, I, th I thank you, Madam Chair, and I, I am excited about continuing along these lines that we are continuing to look at um, how people are allowed to vote in America. And the one thing that we do want to always make sure is that we have the ability to, to make it accessible um, to everyone. We want to make sure we have checks and balances. And as this committee continues to look at this, I, I continue to ask that we uh, make sure we gather all information from all sides. Because as you said in your opening statement, same-day voter registration 
some states have it. There are criticisms on both sides of the aisle. And, and one thing that I think we are held accountable to as members is making sure we gather all the information. And that's why I continue to ask that um, as we move forward, we don't limit the number of people that can have witnesses here, that we make sure we have a fair and balanced approach, one that has views from all sides so we are able to gather all the information before we make a decision. Um, unfortunately, though, um, again, this committee has shifted from the past history and tradition of being equal in that basis, and the witnesses have not been equal. So. Um, I would like to submit on um, House Rule 11 a minority hearing so we can continue to gather information as we Well, I will accept now. this and it will be dealt with under the rules. I would note for the record that we did approve a 6 to 4 witness ratio uh, for this hearing, and uh, but the minority only brought three witnesses, so there's nothing I can do about that. And uh, with that, we um, will... Uh, ma Madam Chair, that, that, that would be the first time I have heard of... Um, more than three witnesses been approved. No, I did, I did that personally uh, well, earlier this week. Well, I, I would, one, want to thank you for that. Two, I would like to meet with you afterwards then because I was, did not have knowledge of that. And I, I'm being told by my staff they didn't. So I, I would, one, want to thank you from the 6 to 4 and continue to ask that we keep with tradition of the 109th Congress that we actually have 6 to 6. But uh, thank you for increasing to six to four. Well, as and, I've said, uh, and I, I don't want to delay this because we do have a room full of witnesses and, and the public. I've always been available for a discussion and uh, would welcome one uh, at any time, but not at the hearing. Um, and now I'd like to recognize our first two witnesses. Um, we have uh, two members of Congress. Uh, first, we have Keith Ellison. Uh, from Minnesota, Congressman Ellison is a newly elected member of Congress representing the 5th Congressional District of Minnesota, which includes the city of Minneapolis and the surrounding suburbs. He previously served two terms in the Minnesota State House of Representatives, and while in the state legislature, he served on the Public Safety Policy and Finance Committee and the Election and Civil Law Committee. Uh, Representative Ellison now serves on the Financial Services and the Judiciary Committee, along with me. Uh, we welcome his uh, testimony today, and of course, he is the author of a bill to provide for uh, same-day uh, uh, election day registration. We also have Steve King of Iowa. Uh, Congressman King was elected in 2002 to represent Iowa's 5th Congressional District. He serves on the House Small Business Committee, uh, the Committee on Agriculture, and he is also a member of the House Judiciary Committee, serving on the con Constitution and immigration subcommittees. As a matter of fact, he is the ranking member of the immigration uh, subcommittee, which I chair. Uh, prior to joining Congress, he served on the Iowa, uh, in the Iowa State Senate for six years, where he assumed roles as chairman of the State Government Committee and vice chairman of the Oversight Budget Committee. And we uh, welcome both of you today. And if we, you know the drill, we've got about both of your statements are made part of the official record. We'd ask you to uh, limit your oral testimony to about five minutes, and we will begin with you, Mr. Ellison. Thank you, Madam Chair. Let me start by thanking you, Madam Chair, um, and uh, the ranking member, uh, McCarthy, for holding this important hearing on Election Day registration and provisional voting. Madam Chair, I'd also like to thank your staff and the House Administration staff, as well as my own staff, who have done an excellent job preparing for today. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of Minnesota Secretary of State Mark Ritchie, who is here to testify, and of course, our former Minnesota Secretary of State, Mary Kiffmeyer, who's also here, and I thank, uh, thank uh, them both for being here. Um, I'm honored to be here to discuss the importance of Election Day registration. Madam Chair, I'm also committed and passionate about Election Day voter registration, and I'm so committed to it that I introduced H.R. 2457, the Same Day Voter Registration Act of 2007. We have 41 co-sponsors. My distinguished predecessor, Martin Sabo, championed this legislation in years past, and I'm honored to continue that tradition, and I feel that we have made some important progress in our effort to extend voting rights to all Americans. My home state of Minnesota has been a national leader when it comes to elections and election administration. We consistently rank at the top nationally in voter turnout. For example, in 2004, presidential election, 78% of eligible voters in Minnesota cast a ballot. This is more than 18% higher than the nav national average. In 1998, a non-presidential year, there were nationally only 30 to 35% of eligible voters who cast a ballot. 
voter turnout topped out uh, more than 60 percent. Additionally, when it comes to election administration, Minnesota consistently conducts one of the most efficient, fraud-free, and error-free elections time and time again. And though I do believe some share credit, I mean many people share credit for Minnesota's national leadership on elections, credit needs to go to committed public servants like Mark Ritchie and several local election officials who manage these elections. Minnesota laws, like the same-day voter registration statute, have contributed to this stellar national reputation. My home enacted the same-day voter registration about 25, almost 25 years ago. Since the right to vote is such an important and fundamental right, I believe the right to vote should not be conditional on any ability to navigate bureaucracy or to meet artificial and arbitrary deadlines. America, Madam Chair, has consistently moved towards voter access throughout its entire history. With the 13th Amendment striking down involuntary servitude, the 14th Amendment, which actually incentivized voter participation of the newly freedmen, and of course the 15th Amendment, which allowed for universal male suffrage. Of course, America wasn't done then. The 19th Amendment allowed for universal adult suffrage, which when it included and recognized the right of women to vote in 1920. But of course, it didn't stop there. The 24th Amendment, uh, banned poll taxes and other taxes associated with being a barrier, a financial barrier to voting. But then in 1965, we saw the Voting Rights Act, which uh, for the first time really struck down all the tools, devices, and tricks that eliminated people from voter participation. And then of course in the 1970s, we lowered the voting age to 18 years old. Madam Chair, I believe that EDR is a logical extension of America's ever increasing uh, desire to see more and more people express their view as to who should represent them in this great representative democracy. I strongly encourage colleagues in Congress to follow the lead of states like Minnesota to enact same-day voter registration. Let me conclude by quoting from the New York Times op-ed piece written by Republican and Democratic Secretaries of State of Ohio and Maine. The quote is as follows. Though one of us is Republican and the other is a Democrat, we can attest that political affiliation isn't relevant here. This is a policy, election day registration, that is good for voters, regardless of party, and good for our democracy. When it comes to elections, America is best served when all eligible voters cast ballots, even those who miss the registration deadline. And I might add, Madam Chair, that in my own state of Minnesota, we have seen Republican governors elected and reelected. We saw an independent party governor, Governor Ventura, elected. We've seen Democratic uh, governors elected, and we've seen both houses shift back and forth. Same day voter registration doesn't favor a party, it favors voters. Madam Chair and members of the committee, I, would, I could not agree more with the both Republican and Democratic secretaries of state of I, I, uh, Idaho and Maine. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify this morning. Thank you very much, Mr. Ellison. Mr. King. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member McCarthy. I appreciate these hearings today, and uh, I, I listen uh, carefully and attentively to the gentleman from Minnesota's uh, testimony, and I want to commend him for taking an initiative on something he believes in, in fact, to the point where um, uh, we had a conversation about these bills, and um, that, I think, was when uh, the gentleman from Minnesota became aware that I have taken an entirely different position on this and 180 degrees off. And I'd like to just take, if I could, uh, the committee back through some of those points uh, that brought me to the position that I have taken, and that is the 2000 elections. And this nation and the world stood transfixed, wondering who would be the next leader of the free world. All eyes went to Florida. We watched it 24-7. I was at 37 days in, in, in investigating the things that were coming up as allegations in Florida and the challenge as to what would be counted as a legitimate vote and what would not be counted as a legitimate vote. At the time, I was the chairman of the Iowa State Senate State Government Committee, and I knew the responsibility fell to me to make any changes in the Iowa law if we were going to avoid ever becoming a state in the position that Florida was in. 
And while those 37 days unfolded, some say 36, it was 37 for me, I had, I chased down every rabbit trail on the internet I could find for voter integrity, um, ballot integrity, and examined this thing from a constitutional perspective, a historical perspective, and also from the statutory perspective. I, I believe in that concept of federalism. This is something that we've left to the states, but the question that hangs out here for anyone who is, takes a, a side on, on federalism, and that being the states' rights component of this, you still have to ask the question, but for 527 votes in Florida, there would be a different leader of the free world probably today. That changes history in this nation is susceptible to decisions that are made within the states. Now, we're here talking about federal legislation, but I came to this conclusion uh, that there was significant fraud taking place in many places across the country. There was, there was plenty of evidence of that in, in different areas. I came to the conclusion that we needed a voter registration list in each of the states that would be free of duplicates, deceased, and where the law applies, felons. And that we need, to, we need to verify that the people that showed up to vote under the name that they alleged they had actually could prove that they were that person. That means a picture, picture ID. And uh, I believe that they should be citizens, and they should verify that they're citizens. I would ask that the Secretary of State of each of the states certify the citizenship of the people on the voter registration rolls. I think that the list should be sorted and crunched, and the most recent registration be the one retrain retained and the duplicate registrations that might be in multiple precincts or multiple counties or multiple states eventually would be purged. That's my view because 527 people in Florida selected the leader in the free world. When they did that, if there had been just that many that cast illegitimate ballots and canceled out the legitimate ballots that made the difference, it is as egregious to have a legitimate ballot canceled out as it is to tell someone who is legitimate that they can't vote. And uh, I ran into protection for opportunities for fraud. And so as I look at this legislation, and if you, I'm opposed to motor voter, by the way, because that brings in people that aren't citizens and brings in people that aren't legitimate to vote in those precincts. But it gives them that opportunity that here's your driver's license, and now how would you like to register to vote? The implication is that you're a citizen, and I know that there are restraints on perjury charges, but that isn't something that we've seen people use. And so as I look down through this list of, of things, if someone shows up to vote same-day registration, and their, and their ballot goes into the, pa into the pot with everyone else, and it's not a provisional ballot, you have no way to correct the inequity that is there. So I would say, first of all, if this legislation is to be approved, it should be provisional ballots only for same-day registration. I'd also point the, ca the cause out here to say that you do not have to produce an identification. You can walk in then and allege to be anyone, and no one can challenge who you are, and you're allowed to vote. So the limitations that we would have left if the Ellison legislation approves will be any willing voter, any willing traveler voter can, will, can vote in any precinct they choose under an unchallenged ballot, one that's not provisional, that goes right into the account with everyone else, and there's no way to verify that. And if we lose our electoral process, we have to have the maximum amount of integrity here. And this is something that I would be willing to take significant political loss on policies and issues that I care a lot about to be in order to preserve this constitutional republic that depends for Democrats and Republicans upon the integrity of the electoral system. We've seen the acrimony that came out of the questions in Florida. And yet, I haven't seen the evidence that there was anything other than the appropriate result in those 2000 elections. But if we lose our faith in our electoral process, if we fail to maintain the integrity that the American people will demand of us, our electoral system will collapse around us, and neither Republicans or Democrats will be standing when the, when the dust settles. So that's where I want the maximum amount of integrity. I want to preserve this system, no matter who it advantages, Republicans or Democrats. It's more important we preserve our constitutional republic. I'd conclude my testimony. Thank the Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. King and Mr. Ellison. I am advised that we will have votes uh, at about 10.30, so we will have time to throw a couple of questions to our colleagues now, if we wish, and then we will come back for the other uh, two panels. Would you like oh, to pr proceed? Well, well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one, I want to thank both panels. This is what I always envisioned. I, I want, before I gather information, I want both sides. And um, Mr. Ellison, I, I, I respect both opinions, Mr. King, you want to make it easier for voters to be able to go vote. 
Mr. King's concern is you want to make sure that there's integrity in the election system. And so really that's what I want to be able to gather. I, I have a, a belief in both of you. And so I want to find how we can make it that we get the voters to the polls at the same time we have um, trust in what elections are held. Now you want to take this nationwide. And I, I will tell you as we've gathered information here on other bills, we had the Secretary of State from Vermont here talking about absentee ballots. In Vermont, they don't even check your signature. And her answer to me was, we trust everybody, we know everybody. That may work in a very small state. I have real concerns with that. But putting things nationwide, I give great concerns. One question I have for you, Mr. Ellison. If you vote, and you, you have to vote to register that same day inside your bill, is that correct first? And then secondly, w would you be open to making that a provisional ballot? Because once you put that into the mainstream, um, the ballot into the box, there's no way of checking how that person voted. There's no way of checking if there is any concerns or questions. That would be my first question to you. Well, first of all, let me uh, make sure I understand what you're asking me. You're saying that you're asking if someone wants to en engage in same-day voter registration, would, would they be expected to register and vote on the same day? Well, the, way, the way I read your bill, if, if you want to register that same day, right. you have to vote. I, am I reading it wrong? I think you, I don't think you'd be required to vote. I think that you could, but you certainly would show up to the polls to register in order to vote. So I think people would be expected to vote and people would be expecting to vote. And I would bet that uh, people who show up would be there to vote. But I don't, I don't read a, a fundamental requirement that you must vote if you register on that day. Then about in order the to vote, in order to participate in, in that election, you have to register and so you vote. don't you don't have to vote but if you register that same day on no. your bill so you basically you want to know can you go in and just register and then walk away yes i think that a person could register to vote at any time during the year to register for that election to be eligible to vote in that election uh, you you know you, you would vote, you would be expected to vote on that day, but I don't think you'd necessarily have to. And what about a provision, that person voting a provisional ballot instead of voting a regular ballot? I would not favor that because I think that we have other protections to make certain that, that the person is uh, who they say they are. Now remember, uh, there's been talk about photo IDs today. That's not what we're talking about here. When you register to vote, when you register, not cast a ballot, but register, you would have to, and, and the states would, be, there's nothing in this bill to prohibit the states to require that you uh, identify yourself with valid uh, identification in order to register to vote. Mm -hmm. Now you, you have, I know we're not talking about your other bill, but you have introduced another bill, 4026, that prohibits election officials from requiring an ID. Right. Right, okay. The, I only bring that up because uh, later that could come into play here. Are you familiar with in Milwaukee um, on their same day registration where they, they had a task force. And I don't know, in Minnesota, you, you, you say there hasn't been any concerns and I haven't found any yet. But in Milwaukee, they had the FBI, the uh, chief of police, and they found 1,300 same day registrations that were cast with problems. Um, they found 141 that weren't even inside the city. And I get concerns when you go statewide. What checks and balances do you have in Minnesota in, in this provision that you go forward, forward now? Well, Minnesota has a long reputation of having good, clean elections. I think that you'll hear that from the former Secretary of State and the present one who will testify today. But if you vote, uh, if you vote fraudulently vote in Minnesota, that's a felony offense. That subjects you to uh, serious criminal penalties, something that just people don't do. Also in Minnesota, we have pr provisions to challenge people. Uh, so if you have substantive information that the person is not who they say they are, you know, there, there are provisions for challenges. But how do you, okay, if you challenge somebody, how do you find that ballot of what they voted? Because if you do provisional, it is off to the side. If, if you let them have the exact same ballot when they're going in the same day, and you find the 141 and, or the 1300, there's no way of knowing which ballot was there or how they voted. Yeah. So I'm just wondering from a checks and balance point, how do you, deb how, how do you answer that question? Well, the fact is, is that, you know, we have, it's a crime to do. We have people who can challenge you. You have to sign an app, you have to swear under penalty of perjury. And the fact is, I can tell you that our track record has been excellent. 
And so uh, it's what we've been doing has been working. I mean, if the proof of the pudding is in the tasting, elections in Minnesota taste pretty good. It just uh, just quick second, yes or no. W would you be open to, if you moved your bill forward, um, amending it to that you, at the beginning, you made these individuals vote provisional to make sure the checks and balances were there? Well, let me say this, uh, Representative. I, I'm one who w never, never says we won't talk, but I, I don't think I would agree to that provisional uh, provision. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, I'd just like to ask um, Mr. Ellison about you've got a real experience here in the, your state and uh, you know in the whole issue of voting lots of times there you know various hints of you know there's fraud but i like to just take a look at have there been any prosecutions because you know if that's the real proof i mean it's right. you know I, I remember going to a hearing a year ago august and all these wild comments about but there had been no prosecution so that's you know the proof's in the pudding and and what's been your experience in Minnesota? Has anybody been prosecuted for fraud on, Madam, on Madam Chair, associated I, with this? I cannot report any known cases of convictions for election fraud. Now, we do have two secretaries of state coming behind me. They well, might I'll ask them, too. Yeah, but I would like to just tell you that I'm not inexperienced on this. I have researched this. I have looked into it carefully. And I have a close friend who some of my Minnesota colleagues know very well. His name is Pat Diamond. He's a tough prosecutor. He'll, he'll charge you and toss you in jail if you violate the law. And Pat Diamond, who's a prosecutor in Hennepin County, has told me that he has never prosecuted a, a vote, a, an imposter voter case. This just hasn't happened. And this is a gentleman who takes his role as a prosecutor extremely seriously. So I'd like to know uh, if, I mean, if, but so I guess the answer is no, but uh, there are better minds than mine here. Now, what's happened to turnout in Minnesota? I mean, usually the problem is, not not one where people are you know trying to fake fake it to vote. It's like trying to get people to vote. <laughs> what right. what is turnout been? Yeah, in, you in know, Madam Chair, we have trouble getting people to vote one time, as a, uh, you know, let alone two. But uh, the fact is, voter turnout in Minnesota is excellent. Seventy eight percent. Seventy eight percent. Yeah, we've we've experienced very high voter turnout. We did have vi high voter turnout in the early years, fifties, sixties. Then it then it dipped. And since we enacted voter uh, uh, EDR, it dramatically came back up to a point where we're, ha we're real happy about. Now, I remember um, the election of Governor Ventura. I mean, i just reading about it. But it seemed to me from the press reports that that just took off at the end and that it was uh, people who had not been registered voters but who got excited by his campaign at the, you know, b after the registration would have been over, who actually decided to come forward that he touched something in them and, and inexplicably surprised the whole country that this guy who no one thought was going to win won. Was that, do you think, because of the Election Day registration? Yes, I do. And I think it's a very good thing. I think it's important, you know, to leave alone what kind of governor people thought. Governor Ventura made. I think he had. Well, it's up to the voters in Minnesota to decide, right. not me. But they expressed a preference. Students expressed a preference. People who had moved had expressed a preference. I think that if what we're trying to do is most closely approximate how people really feel, uh, that EDR brings us very close to that. Because, of course, as you know, Madam Chair, there's a lot of voter information that comes through in the last days of the campaign. You know, people may not focus, people are busy, but in that last month of the campaign where an artificial deadline may cut you out, you can still listen, read, focus, hear debates, and really make up your mind as to who you want to vote for. I'm going to yield back my time because we are being called to votes, and I want Mr. Ellis to have his chance to ask questions before we run off to, um, to vote. Uh, th thank you, Madam Chair. And just uh, in response to a previous question and answer interchange with Mr. McCarthy. As I read the bill, you say, on the date of the election, the polling place may not make services available under this section to any eligible applicant who does not cast a ballot. So basically you're saying if they register, they have to vote. Or in other words, they're not even going to be registered if they don't agree to vote. Well, uh, Mr. Representative, Maybe I, that's not I, read it, I read it a little bit differently. Um, I don't think this is the most critical part of the bill, but no, the way I, 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 I read it, 
I agree, are, and I, I don't yeah. think that's that's not a major matter. I'm just pointing, it's in your bill. Yeah, it is and, in my and bill, and I'm familiar with that section. The way I read that is if you want to vote in that election that day, then vote, registering, registering that day makes you eligible to vote in that election for yeah. that day. But, but, not but I think that if you wanted to if you wanted to register to vote the next day, at the day after election, I don't see any rule that would say you couldn't fill out a voter uh, application to register to vote. Okay, I just want to try to clarify that issue. I, I was born in Minnesota, southwestern Minnesota. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's made me what I am today, a good, solid Republican. <laughs> <laughs> good one, good one. <laughs> no, seriously, it was, I was, grew up in Edgerton, a very fine town. Everyone knew everyone, uh, very little crime. There was some crime, uh, but I think, uh, you know, same day registration would work there easily because everyone knew everyone. Uh, and maybe that's what you're referring to. But I refuse to believe that there are no criminals in Minnesota and that no one might try to take advantage of this. Even if there weren't, we're talking about federal legislation and the history of our, our country, uh, is frankly, a shameful history is that in certain areas of the country, there's considerable dishonesty in elections. And this particular issue, and I totally agree with Mr. King on this, uh, this creates incredible opportunities for mischief and frankly, for breaking the law. Uh, we're all familiar with Tammany Hall, the Prendergast machine, the Daily machine, you can go on and on. Uh, they certainly played every trick in the book and same-day res registration has the potential for doing that unless the ballot that the person cast is a provisional ballot. So in case they are breaking the law by what they have done, uh, then you can discard their ballot and no harm is done. If you allow the ballot to be tossed in the hopper and counted, you have done permanent damage. You have cheated the public of a fair election. And I, I think the, the key factor of same-day registration is to make certain it's a provisional ballot. Related to this, of course, is the requirement that we passed with HAVA that every state has to establish a statewide voter database to keep track of registrations and so forth. Uh, that's essential to determine if someone, regardless of whether they're registering the same day or not, are, are voting twice. And so I, I just have experienced and seen enough fraud around the country that I'm very worried about adding a, something that would make fraud easier for those who are dishonest. It also, what you're proposing, makes voting easier for those who are honest. And I, I don't object to that, really. Uh, but you have to protect against fraud if you're going to provide extra opportunities for fraud, which is what your bill does. Uh, and. Um, and I, th I think we have to be very, very careful about that. If we're going to try and make this a national issue instead of an issue state by state where all the good people of Minnesota who by and large obey the law wouldn't do anything wrong, uh, I'm very worried about passing a law that's going to apply everywhere in the country where there's plenty of chance for mischief and downright dishonesty. I appreciate your uh, comments. May I comment very briefly, Madam Chair? Uh, let me just say this very quickly. Um, you know, the people who are um, in a, live in a precinct, even if you live in an urban area, you know, it's like a small town. I mean, the people, you know, for example, there might just be one building that people vote at, and that's like the whole precinct. So even though it's an urban area, there is a, there, it is a closely knit or unit, a unit that people are voting in. So uh, there, there, really is, there really is quite a substantial amount of that small town atmosphere. Uh, people know each other. So I, I think we probably got to vote, but I do appreciate your question. Thank you very much. Well, I'd hate to depend on that simply because I live in a, in a relatively small urban neighborhood. I've served in local government. I know a lot of people. But when I go to the precinct to vote, I see a lot of people there I don't know. And when I talk to the election clerks, they see a lot of people they don't know. Uh, and so I, I think caution is best in a situation <laughs> like this. As Mr. King said, we really have to guarantee the purity of the ballot to reassure the voters 
that the result is accurate and that it follows the intention the, of the The gentleman's time has expired and we have been yeah. called to vote. So I will uh, uh, recess this hearing now thanking both of our colleagues for their testimony. We will return as soon as votes are uh, done and uh, commence with the other two panels. Thank mm -hmm. you.